Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more of our virtual conversations. With us is Casey Schwartz. Casey Schwartz is a distinguished author. She's also a wife and a recent mother. She's written an amazing new book entitled Attention, A Love Story, in which she analyzes the phenomenon of human attention in the context of a personal memoir, which is a coming of age. We're delighted to welcome Casey Schwartz to the program. It's so great to be here, Jim. Thank you. Now, uh, we, I'm always fascinated by titles. And uh, your title is uh, uh, kind of ambiguous because you call it attention. And then you say a love story. Why is it a, about attention? And why is it a love story? I really wanted to convey how emotional the subject of attention is. Um, not just for me, but in general. Um, it's, it's, it's a force that shapes our lives, that gives our days meaning. And it's not the dry, intellectualized or cognitive um, subject that I feel like sometimes we can think of it as. It's so personal and it's so meaningful. And I wanted that to be captured by the title. But also the book is a quest to understand and maybe even capture some attention back in this age of distraction. And I think, you know, there's, there's an aspect of it, of attention, of looking for attention that's always going to be a little bit unrequited, like a love story. Well, we need to pay attention. There's no question about that. And there are all sorts of things going on in the world we have to pay attention to, including ourselves. Uh, but uh, we uh, also are in need of distraction. What's wrong right. with distraction? Is distraction the enemy of attention? Definitely not. I mean, I think right now, we've never been more in need of taking ourselves out of any situation, out of this, the catastrophe that is the coronavirus. But I think the, what inspired me to write this book was this feeling that actually we had lost agency and volition. So when you're on your phone and you're, and I don't know, Jim, if you're an Instagram person, whatever your particular vice is. Too old on, for Instagram. I have, I have vices, but it doesn't include Instagram. Like, well, whatever it is, you know, I, I, I was so troubled by that feeling of like, I no longer control my mind. You know, it's not just that I'm seeking distraction. It's that distraction is seeking me. And that was, to me, that was the problem of feeling that, okay, I've given up agency to these gadgets from Silicon Valley. That's what I wanted to push back on in this book. Well, is part of your argument that we need to pay more attention to others? I mean, remember Death of a Salesman, you don't uh, mention it in the book, but there's that marvelous line uh, riddled with attention uh, where the wife says about Willie Loman, I don't say he's a great man, Willie Loman never made a lot of money. His name was never in the paper. He's not the finest character that ever lived, but he's a human being and a terrible thing is happening to him. So attention must be paid. He's not to be allowed to fall in his grave like an old dog. Attention, attention must finally be paid to such a person. Is that what you're talking about? Jim, thank you so much for reading that whole quote. I feel that elevates us immediately. Well, I, 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 I tried to edit it down, but it's so marvelous. I thought I had to read it in its entirety. Exactly. It's so powerful. And yes, in a way, yes, it is a version of what I'm talking about. Because I think in some sense, in our tech saturation state, we've lost the ability to see people in their full humanity. I mean, you know the feeling of being on Twitter. People are classified as good or bad, black or white, you know, um, canceled or morally acceptable. It's so binary, it's so flattening and it's so dehumanizing. So yes, I do think that our tech encourages that kind of snap judgment where we lose the richness of seeing each other fully. And in a sense that quote about Willie Loman does go to the heart of some of the themes of this book, which is about attention, compassion and love. Now, uh, there's also a political component, isn't there? Because uh, we're living in an era of uh, truth decay, uh, mm -hmm. thanks to uh, Donald Trump. Uh, and it's really difficult for anyone to form an intelligent opinion without having the facts. And right. to have the facts, we have to pay attention. So is now more than ever, 
uh, attention is very important. Absolutely, and actually one of the um, interesting people, characters in the book is a guy named James Williams, who was worked at Google for years, then went on to write this book um, called Stand Out of My Light. And he argues that um, there's a sort of, it's, it's not just about these daily distractions that we all kind of bemoan. You know, it's not just about getting distracted by Twitter. It's about this societal decay and this feeling that we're losing our overarching and shared principles, what he calls our daylight and our starlight. And there's this real sense that we're sort of in a, we're in a void as we step into this deeper and deeper distraction because we don't really know what we, what we have consensus on as a group. And I think well, that's a really profound observation. I think so too. And uh, James Williams is kind of a, uh, uh, in words, palindrome uh, for William James, who was one of the pillars in your book. I mean, he was the father of all intention, wasn't he? And uh, attention. And uh, he said, without attention, experience is another chaos. Right. And we kind of build on that in, as part of the uh, psychological and scientific component for the book, don't you? You can't write about attention without bringing up William James. It's absolutely impossible because he was sort of the, beside being a psychologist, he wrote as beautifully as a novelist and a poet in a way. He sort of took the subject of attention in the late 19th century. It had never been granted its own standing. Um, as, a, as a subject worthy of scientific inquiry. And he wrote about it so in such an elevated, beautiful way as, you know, attention is how we, how we choose, what, what we, our experience is what we choose to attend to. So our life is literally shaped by what, by what we choose to give our attention to. And William James was a major figure in making attention sort of, raising the stakes of attention and making it a subject in its own right. Your book uh, begins with a discussion of uh, a famously attention uh, enhancing drug called Adderall. It's kind of the beginning of Moby Dick, call me Ishmael. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> and you discuss the, the drug in some detail and you have a decade long involvement with it. Um, uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely. That Adderall was, in a way, this was the gateway for me into being my obsession with attention. Because I got to college, it was the year 2000. I had barely ever heard of ADHD. It was still kind of rare. Um, attention, hyperactivity, deficit disorder. I had never heard of Adderall. And a friend handed me this blue pill our freshman year. And you know, I told her, my God, I have this essay due tomorrow. I'm never going to get it done. She said, take this. I don't like it. It wheels in the hall. I'll never forget her saying those words because to me, that was so enticing. And I took this pill. It was like a key in the lock for me personally, in the sense that I had boundless energy and focus. And I basically stayed on those pills for the next 12 years of my life even though I never really had ADHD, or at least I don't think I did. Um, I was able to get my own prescription alarmingly easily, and it sort of defined the next decade of my life, being on this drug that for me represented attention. Well, is uh, Adderall a, a cognitive enhancing drug, or is it uh, really a drive drug? It sort of makes you want to run out there and do something. I mean, that's the great debate. And there's, there's a lot of question marks around if you're taking amphetamines, but you don't have ADHD, do they actually make you perform better? And actually, a lot of the research suggests no, they don't. If you're sort of medium or high performing, there's a suggestion that they make you perform worse on tasks of creativity and cognition. Um, but these are all questions that have yet to be answered. And I think what they do give you is this illusion that you are just, you are just flying. You are just functioning at full speed ahead. You've never been better. Um, and um, that's kind of your perception of your own performance. 
But well, you're you're a writer. What did it do uh, to your creativity and uh, to uh, your uh, ability to focus on, uh, which is something writers have to do. Right. I mean, every writer cares about attention, right? But I think you know, it, you sort of, for me, I sort of lost the forest for the trees because Adderall gave me such a nose to the grindstone kind of, you know, claustrophobic vision of my own work and my own um, thoughts that it wasn't until I was 30 and I was finally able to get off of it that I feel like my career kind of began, um, even though I've been working as a reporter. Is it an addictive drug? I mean, is it dangerous in the sense that um, narcotics are addictive? Or nicotine? Yes, I mean, it's amphetamine. Yeah. And it's alarmingly similar to methamphetamine. It's actually almost exactly the same thing as methamphetamine. But it's kind of, you know, acceptable and dressed up, you know, for yeah, achievement and success. Right. It's not, you don't take Adderall to sort of drop out of your life. You take Adderall to succeed. And uh, did you find you did succeed or succeeded beyond your... Uh... Uh, your boundaries because you were on Adderall or did you find no. that it had a, a negative effect? For me, Adderall was hugely, hugely destructive. Um, my schoolwork got unmanageable. Then through my 20s, I was sort of in a state of like isolated urgency and stress trying to write my first book, a book that was canceled by its first publisher. It was such a mess. And it really wasn't until I got off that I feel like I wrote with any kind of clarity. And uh, when you did get off, tell us how you got off. How did you kick the habit? Getting that first book canceled by its first publisher, I realized I had sort of sabotaged myself with years of being on a drug that I really didn't need to be on. And when I got the chance to rewrite it with a second publisher and an incredible editor, I thought to myself, this is the moment where if I continue to take this drug, I don't really deserve any more second chances. It was sort of like hitting rock bottom to get the book canceled and then to get this unexpected um, hand held out to me. So I took it. And that first book, which is not this book, uh, was about psychology and science, wasn't it? It Neuro was, and the irony was it was about neuroscience. So I knew exactly what Adderall was doing to my brain. And I would read these studies about how amphetamines would suppress play and playfulness in rats and sort of do all these alarming things to inner life. You know, I knew exactly what, what it was doing in the brain. Um, and yet I would continue to sort of tinker with my own brain anyway. Well, uh, your uh, book, perhaps I alluded to this before, is buttressed by uh, at least four uh, literary anchors, uh, William James, David Foster Wallace, Aldous Huxley, and uh, Simone Weil, the French mystic. Exactly. Uh, and uh, all of them were interested in belief of, and religion. So is religion somehow or other uh, interrelated with attention? I came to think it was somehow because after very late in the process, I realized I had chosen these four writers because they were all sort of borderline obsessed with attention and the power of attention, this ethics and stakes of attention. And only at the very end of the process did I realize, oh, they all share this common interest as well, which is faith and belief. You know, and you don't think David Foster Wallace and religion but actually he tried to join the Catholic church and was always sort of interested in what this was all about. Um, and I don't have the answer to this, but I find it a fascinating puzzle. It's as if, you know, there's this idea of wanting to believe and wanting to devote yourself and devote your attention um, kind of winds up dovetailing with, with religious faith. Uh, now, uh, is attention something that we acquire in the course of our lives or is it uh, or perhaps attention deficit? Is it something that uh, we uh, um, get from our environment or is attention deficit something that's biological, genealogical uh, uh, that uh, we inherit? Well, I think in terms of attention itself, um, we should think of it as a cognitive muscle, Jim. And it's, it is a skill that you learn and that you fortify. 
as you get muscle, older. So you have to yeah. exercise it. Yes, in a way, yes. You work um, out. We work out every day on attention. <laughs> right, and you know, I mean, even William James knew that, and he was writing in the nineteenth century, and I think that's still considered true. But there are a lot of different theories on attention deficit, and one of the um, interesting people that I include in the book is a doctor named Gabor Mate, who says no, ADHD is not biological. It's not genetic. It begins in early childhood when children are in a stressful environment and they distract themselves because it's easier than being in the present moment. And that is the core of what later becomes the diagnosis ADHD, those coping mechanisms. Uh, well, uh, just to move on, uh, one of your literary models is Aldous Huxley. You mentioned him. He's the author of Brave New World. Maybe we're entering a brave new world post-coronavirus. You seem to be. Uh, and, um, of course, he was very much interested in attention. He was also interested in technology. Mm -hmm. That man is a victim of his own technology instead of being in control of it. Now, right. here we have the internet. We have the phone. Uh, the other day, I... Uh, just before uh, the lockdown, I went to a restaurant and a young couple entered the restaurant. They sat across from each other, apparently for a romantic dinner. And no sooner they sit down, they both took out their cell phones and they started texting God knows who. I mean, have we become <laughs> slaves to uh, technology and the distraction? Jim, maybe they were texting each other. Uh, that's hard <laughs> to believe. Why don't they talk directly? <laughs> We've all seen that site, you know? We've all seen like the 11 year old kid on his iPad at a group dinner with his headphones on the whole time. You know, we've all seen it and we've all been there, right? I mean, I'm not above that. And I will turn to my husband when we're both on our phones and I'll say like, oh God, we're zombie couple right now, just to kind of try to snap us out of it. But I mean, this is, this is yeah, this is a feature of our modern life now, isn't it? And we've all seen it. Well, you're raising a son. Uh, do you plan to restrict uh, his access to the screen, to the internet, to the phone? And for how long? Yes, yes, and yes. Although he's only four months old. And during my pregnancy, I was so adamant. Oh, he won't be exposed to screens till he's three. You know, and of course, during this corona catastrophe, that kid has been on FaceTime for hours a day. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually worried about it. You know, and I think, but I think, what are the options? This is the only way he sees his uncle and his grandparents. Uh, well, uh, so you have the question, uh, I mean, we had the uh, so-called Spanish flu in 1918, which killed hundreds of thousands of Americans. Uh, and it really originated not in Spain, but in Kansas, where there were the first reported cases. Right. Not many people know that. Uh, but. Uh, at the time of the Spanish flu, there was no technology. Uh, and while they did try to uh, engage in, uh, in social distancing, uh, they weren't entirely successful. Uh, but hasn't technology made it possible for us to uh, uh, take uh, life-saving measures such as social distancing? Yes, we would be, I mean, we, this is miraculous. And I, you know, the other day, Eric Schmidt said in an interview, well, I hope they're grateful now. <laughs> He was and the I former think, CEO of Google, made a fortune. <laughs> exactly. And he, so he's saying, you know, there's been a lot of snarky comments about tech recently, but now look, we've sort of saved your lives and saved your careers and saved your social lives to some extent now that you're all at home. But I think, I, I don't know about you, Jim, but I've never been more aware of what these screens are not provided. You know, there's this visceral lacking. And so I actually wonder when we get out of confinement, if we're all just going, if there's going to be a movement or a slight backlash away from tech, even as our world becomes more virtual. It's, it's a paradox and I'm, I'm curious to see how it plays out. Well, you like to read a lot, your writers read a lot. Uh, do you read paper books or do you read, um, um, you know, Kindle? Both, I love how on an iPad you can save with, you, with the swipe of your finger, you can save passages that are meaningful, and then they're all organized for you at the end. I That's thought I'd do that with your book, but I saved almost every word in the book. <laughs> oh, Jim, thank you. 
you also, I mean, you talk in the book about your parents, which is uh, uh, very, very interesting, and how that might relate to attention. And uh, certainly the trip to India with your mother, uh, where <laughs> you found really uh, nothing to do there. It was supposed to be, what, a tiger preserve and there were no tigers? <laughs> and, <laughs> Not and, that. At least you, you found quickly. And, and But she decided to interview the, she's a writer, of course, and a famous journalist, and she interviewed the uh, uh, proprietor about uh, his life or whatever, or where he found his tigers, and, uh, and she became totally absorbed in it. Uh, so that exactly. taught, taught you something about you know, how you can make lemonade out of a lemon if you pay attention. And if you just turn your curiosity to whatever circumstance you're in, you can transform it. And uh, so uh, it, uh, from that, uh, you learn that curiosity is uh, an indispensable ingredient of attention. And curiosity creates attention, doesn't it? Exactly. I mean, no one wants attention where you're just white knuckling your way through a situation. It becomes effortless if you can be genuinely fascinated. Yeah. Well, and then you also talk lovingly about your father, uh, who at age, what, in his 80th year encountered a, a Me Too problem at WNYC, and he was a marvelous uh, disc jockey and performer. I used to listen to him all the time. I really thought he got a terrible rap. Uh, but uh, for you, it was a very personal thing. But how did that relate to attention? And why is it in your book? It's, right. It's well, I mean, story. exactly. Great question. But in the middle of um, doing all this research on attention, my father, age 79, yes, was sort of swept up in the Me Too movement. But we never knew why. We never found out why. But well, what was smacked, it smacked of Kafka, didn't it? Well, you never know what the charge is. It right. Well, and, and, and we literally to this day don't know why. Um, but, you know, watching it play out, because within an hour of WNYC, you know, announcing that, oh, Jonathan Schwartz has been suspended, Twitter had already pronounced him guilty because the way that moral outrage spreads on the internet is so specific. There's even this fascinating neuroscientific research on how nothing captures attention quite like morality and issues of morality, because the brain is so primed to pay attention to who's good and who's bad. And that it's issue- almost, It's also almost impossible to deny. So the charge is there, and you can say, I didn't do it, and you can shout it to the rooftops, but the charge is still there. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it would have been nice if actually if he'd even been able to respond to a charge, a specific charge. I mean, I, I have no idea what what WNYC knows or doesn't know. But I think what what's difficult about some of these Me Too cases, which is such an important movement, is the lack of specificity and the lack of a moment to engage with and maybe even take responsibility for the behavior in question. And so we're, we're just left with this like lingering question mark, you know, what happened? Yes, and uh, it's sort of, as a lawyer, I'm acquainted with the uh, elements of due process uh, <laughs> where you uh, have to be acquainted with the charge, uh, you're entitled to have the charge particularized, and then you're confronted with the witnesses and you have a chance to defend yourself. And you don't have, seem to have any of that here at all. Yes, terrible, right, right. That's, that's so tremendous, interesting, right? I mean, I mean, there's no legal right to um, due process in a workplace situation, right? But uh, due process, there is a legal right to fairness, and mm -hmm. um, and it's your reputation, and it's your life's work, and uh, there should be fairness. Mm -hmm. And without due process, there's no fairness. Mm -hmm. At least I think so. True. Exactly. You know, so uh, what? Uh, does your study of attention uh, tell us about uh, life? Can you uh, perhaps expand on that? <laughs> That's such a big question, but I think- well, You can break what, it down. <laughs> well, I mean, well, what I came out of this book and all the research and reporting that I did for it was just that just being conscious of how limited and how precious my own attention was, was going to be so important moving forward. And that just simply that consciousness of it actually matters where you put your attention. That consciousness 
has never been more important as our lives get more and more virtual. You think we're in a national attention deficit disorder? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if I'd use that diagnosis, but sometimes I have that thought that we can't seem to, you know, stay with one story or one thread. And of course, our president completely inflames that problem. Um, so yes, in a way I do, Jim, and I think we're all sick of it. And so how do we rectify it? Pay more attention? <laughs> we can try. We can, that's all we can do. We've got to keep trying. You have to keep trying. Well, Casey Schwartz, this has been absolutely marvelous. And uh, thank you so much for coming by. You've really amplified my understanding of your book, which is really a must read. I recommend it to everybody. And um, thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in next week for more of our virtual conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care, stay safe, and all the best. Thank you.